Yes, there is an announcement. So by popular request, tomorrow I will not give a lecture. <laughs> Instead, we will do some problems, exercises here. Some I will assign and some you will tell me, you know, I didn't understand this, then I can explain that part. So that is what you have to do. Tomorrow you have to come up prepared with whatever difficulties you have, then you can ask them. Else I will make up some problems and sort of some exercises which I will show you how to do. Okay, so that is for tomorrow. Uh, the last day, uh, Thursday, I will give a different lecture which will be sort of more based on slides than on blackboard because some pictures were needed and so it was necessary to use the PowerPoint presentation. Okay, for, so, so yesterday we had discussed the distributed processes model. This one is also called abelian networks. And uh, there is some nice papers by Levine which you can read up and uh, learn about the stuff. In, you know, some more per different perspective and different questions. Okay, anyway, so we discussed the general problem that there are these computers which uh, are sitting there and then you send in a message, it processes it in some way and sends some messages to other computers which then process it in their own way. And um, the internal state of the computers keeps on changing according to some fixed rules, whatever the in rules of the program. And you look at the overall activity and once it dies, then you send some other message and then we said that can we describe it in some way. And so if for a general network, it will appear that if you send in a message, sometimes there is a very little activity, sometimes one message will give rise to a huge amount of activity. So it is like avalanches in sand piles and we can try to understand how, what happens in these kinds of systems. Of course, the details of what happens depends on what kind of messages you are sending and what kind of processing is being done. And so that is uh, left for, you know, for particular applications. But the general idea is that the overall structure will continue to work and it will perhaps be useful to have whatever general theory we developed will continue to be useful and anything else you will need, you will have to put in specific to the particular application you have in mind. But we discussed some special sort of lattice model <coughs> models of these networks. So we discussed this Eulerian Walker's model. And uh, we said that there is a lattice on each side there is an arrow pointing to one of the neighbors. And the rule is that there is one particular walker, when he comes to a site, he looks at the, where is the arrow pointing, rotates it by 90 degrees in the positive direction, let us say, and goes to the, wherever, it, now it points in the new direction it goes, takes one step. And then goes to a new site, there also there is an arrow, he rotates it by 90 degrees, goes there and so on. So what happens to this walker? Eventually the walker will perhaps leave the lattice, then you add another walker and then it walks until it leaves the lattice and so on. So this is sort of a simple model in which a walker modifies the medium in which it goes and then the medium affects the subsequent motion of the same walker or of the another walker which has been introduced. And it introduces some long range correlations in the directions of arrows in the medium, in the steady state. 
which you can try to understand. Okay. And uh, in particular, we discussed one. Uh, so this can be generalized to any graph. So you have some graph at each vertex. There is an arrow which points to one of the neighbors, and the rule is that you rotate it to the next neighbor. At each side, there is a list of ordered list of neighbors, and then you say, "Oh, now it was in neighbor number five. I go to neighbor number six, neighbor number seven, like that." and it mm, cyclically it goes on and on then on any such graph with any initial orientation of arrows you can show that if you start a walker and let it walk eventually it goes into a cycle and that cycle is very short it's of only length equal to two times the number of links in the graph and in the cycle each link will be traversed once in each direction and so what happens is that initially there is some disordered arrangement of arrows and as the walker moves it keeps on reorganizing the medium so that uh, eventually it falls makes up this circuit which is a closed circuit of length to n where each it's a hamil some generalized hamiltonian circuit in which every bond is visited exactly once in each direction okay all right um so what else can i do about this one so there is one result which we didn't mention last time which i want to mention today so suppose i take this eulerian walker model on the square lattice and i start in the walker at the origin and all the bonds are just put in it random wherever you want and now this walker starts walking then as it walks around uh, it likes to have all the arrows in some particular order so that it can go into a cycle and it doesn't want to keep on coming back to the same site again and again but of course the arrows are set in random so they are not in this way so it's reorganizing the medium in some way so what it does is that it works like this i i will just draw schematically so at any time t it has reached some sites and it has not reached some other sites so the sites it has reached typically what it does is that it organizes it into a local euler circuit in which each site is visited exactly once uh, if you just keep on following it it will not come back to it itself again until every site every bond has been visited once and then it will do it again but you know when it comes out then of course um, there are some bonds on the outside which it encounters which it might have to visit, go there and then it encounters a new thing so the region it explores keeps on increasing and as it explores more region it organizes it also into a local it adds those things into his local tour and keeps on adding like this so if you watch the movie of this stuff at some time t and then say oh in time t it has visited these many sites suppose these are in a radius r so how many times did it did it visit any site in the previous number of visits to some other site in the last pi r squared steps 4 pi r squared step Okay, pi r squared is the area, and four pi r squared is you know the number of bonds multiplied by two directions. So I just ask, okay, um, how often is it visited any other site in this region? The answer is mostly it is four. Every site is visited four times. Inside, at the boundary there is a little bit of flay, 
So, it is locally organizing the stuff into a um, local Eulerian kind of circuit and then there is some stuff at the boundary, these sites are not visited, so it, some mixture, but it keeps on growing. Okay? And so, this R of T. So, after, so in the next pi r squared steps, it visits all these things once or four times and then in the process adds something to the boundary because once it visits a site four times, it has to increase the radius by one. Okay? So, I get this, let us write this equation dr by dt is equal to 1 upon r squared. <coughs> This equation is asymptotically exact given the result that you know each time it has formed a circuit, then in the next r squared or pi r squared steps, it visits everything four times and then in the process the radius will increase by order 1. So, dr by dt is 1 by r squared and that implies that r goes as t to the power one third. So, the radius will keep on increasing, yes. Uh, how is this every side different? Uh, so, I do not actually understand why it happens, but that is what happens. That is what happens for arbitrary graphs is that the system, the arrows get organized into a local Eulerian, Eulerian circuit. Okay? So, here inside the arrows have been modified so that uh, they kind of uh, form us. Let us do it. I think that I can ex try to explain it like this. Suppose I do this in 1D and the arrows are locally like this. It takes time, but let me still try to do it. Okay, so what will happen? I start here then this is the arrow is like this. So, it is supposed to uh, take us rotate it which means it put it here and then go one step here. So, it will sorry and there are two uh, I did not I did not do this very well. So, here this arrow is pointing this way locally and this arrow is pointing this way and this arrow is pointing this way. Let us not look further. Okay. Uh, so, I will draw this better. So, this arrow is pointing this way and this arrow is pointing this way. Okay. So, now when it starts, it rotates this and goes like this and comes here. Now, this arrow is pointing this way, so it flips it. And so, the arrow is now pointing this way and it comes here, but this arrow is pointing this way. So, it flips it and goes like this. Then this arrow is pointing this way, so it goes like that. So, if the arrows are pointing inward, then it keeps on going right, yeah. but if they are going, if they are already right, then it will turn around. When it turns around, then it will encounter all the arrows which are pointing this way. So, it flips them, comes back all the way here and then at some point, it will reverse the direction when it encounters a bad arrow, but it goes and then it goes a little bit further like that. So, in between all the arrows have been made parallel and at the boundary, it keeps on adding new arrows to make them parallel and keeps on growing like this. This picture is a two dimensional version of this picture. Okay? Yes. Uh, no, all one third are not equal to each other. They are equal, but they are not for the same reason. Okay, no, there is no connection, no obvious connection. In fact, if you can find a connection, you know, like you can calculate this exponent, the, the turbulence exponent in some way, you get one third. I would just say that, okay, you know, you got a third, but it does not have to do with this particular model. Okay. Uh, yes. Sorry, you said that the nodes uh, uh, in that bike that have been visited are, have 
been visited four times. Is Within a finite, you know, if you look in a finite time, such that all these sites have been visited, um, you give the system enough time so that it could have visited all these sites, then you will find that it actually does visit all these sites equally. Four times? Yeah. But in that, that example, it will visit... Uh, Twice. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, I said in the last R squared steps it visits okay. Okay. four times. Before that it visited. So, in fact, if you look at the total number of visits, it kind of looks like this. Number of visits is maximum in the middle and sort of the path the walker takes is sort of like this. It goes through everything but increases the radius by a little bit and then goes through everything and increases the radius by a little bit and so on. Okay. The path is not as trivial a path as I have shown. It depends on the details of the circuit, but it shows the property of self-organization. You start with a very random network of bonds, but it's going to be modified in some suitable way, so it, it goes into some particular structure, which is non-trivial. And it is not identical every time you do it, but there are some properties which remain the same. Yes. Why is the, the derivative of R in this respect to time is important? Uh -huh. Okay, so, like okay, so very good. So I said that R at T plus 4 R squared is more or less equal to R at T plus order 1. This is the argument. This was said in words. I didn't write down an equation. But if you accept this equation and then you write R of T plus R dot into R squared equal to R plus 1. Okay? Then you get this re equation. Now, where did I get this equation? This was by this long argument saying that, look, the system organizes its existing region visited into a Euler circuit. And so, it, whenever you put it somewhere, it actually tries to visit all the sites which have been organized. It takes out R squared time. But in that time, it increases the radius by order 1. So, you say that increasing, uh, to increase by order 1, you have to visit the all the sites, Once yeah, more. yeah. Okay. that's what the system does because, the, you know, that is uh, the way we have defined it. The, it's a, yeah, it's a, just a, these rules give you this motion. If you add some other rules, you will perhaps get some other motion. But it's empirical or uh, some of, uh, No, so, yeah, there, there, there is a proof that it goes into a cycle. But all the steps in the proof are not so rigorously established. Um, yeah, so you, you can give a strong, nicer proof. Right now, I will not try to do it. Okay, so next thing. Oh, this result can be generalized to other graphs and indeed dimensions and so on which I will also not do here. It's given in the reference. So, so there is a large class of models where one says that at each toppling, the way the toppling occurs is not fully fixed exactly, but there is a probabilistic toppling. So, sometimes it does this, sometimes it does that, and you specify the probability which we things happen. So, this was originally called some rice pile model. They said that there is some rice and you draw it and throw it. And instead of grains of sand, you make grains of rice. And then they sometimes stick and sometimes they move and the probability that they stick is a little bit different than the mm, the probability they move. And so you make a model in which with some probability the thing sticks, with some probability it moves. 
uh, if it is sticks then the critical height is a little bit bigger mm, then you know whatever you, you make your details but basic ingredient is that the toppling is stochastic and not deterministic different topplings are independent events but each of them is what happens in the toppling is obtained by a random number you do a random pull out a random number based on that you decide what happens so all these stochastic sand pile models can be considered as special examples of abelian models because you just have to say at each point there is a stack of instructions this instruction says that the, if the it gives you the toppling rule it say that at this site next time the toppling rule is if the height is more than 5 then send two particles to north one particle to east okay and once this toppling occurs this thing is erased and the next instruction is read which may be somewhat different okay these instructions could be randomly placed so we are imagining that the infinite list of instructions is already given at each site fixed so now the pile is actually evolving according to deterministic dynamics okay and then this old argument we used continues to work and the process will be abelian different toplings will commute and everything will go through and uh, this result is not immediately obvious if you don't do it this way so for example we said that the basic point is that there is a pile you add at site i and topple and add at site j and topple and if you do them in a different order it doesn't matter but if you have a stochastic sand pile and you add here and something happens if you add here something happens you add them in different order if they are stochastic you cannot be sure that it gives you the same result right but with our version of this stochasticity we say there is a buried deterministic instruction set inside each then the result will be the same and now i go out and say oh but i don't know how the system is generating all these list inside i cannot see it so for me the evolution is effectively markovian and stochastic and so even in the stochastic markovian model you will have the same abelian property now the abelian property means that if you act by ai on c you get configuration c prime with probability of c prime given ah c prime with coefficient probability of c prime given c and you know point of addition so these operators are still matrices but now they are not one zero matrices they are some other matrices but you can still write their evolution rules and you know the, and so what will be the rule here um, so let us take something called the manham model in mana model one says that stable heights are 0 1 if h is bigger if the yeah if z is bigger than equal to 2 then two particles leave each in a random direction so when i suppose there is a pile and i topple in so it has some configuration 0 1 i add here now i am going to throw out two particles so i pick the first particle and decide at random which way will it go for the second particle also i decide at random which way they will go so with some probability both of them will go north with some probability one of them will go north one of them will go west or whatever yes but in the conditional probability the a is the same operator applied to the 
yeah, this is, uh, sorry, I should have, I beg your pardon, I should have written I here. This is the con configuration is C and I have added at I and what is the probability that the final configuration is C prime. Okay. So, now for this uh, model, uh, so we will define these operators A I still, they I will still commute with each other. Uh, and they satisfy again some algebra. What is the algebra? Now the algebra is that A i squared is equal to A i 1 plus A i 2 Okay, this is the operator equations. Okay, and then we said that oh well, uh, these operators can be simultaneously diagonalized. So these are operators. But if they can be simultaneously diagonalized, I can write their eigenvalues, and the eigenvalues will satisfy some equation. So if a i acting on some phi 1, phi 2, phi n is equal to A i hat, A i acting, ah, I do not have to write phi 1, phi 2, phi n, I just write phi. Okay, so these are operators, these are eigenvalues then these eigenvalues satisfy the same equation a i squared is equal to a i 1 plus a i 2. Oh, I had this picture i i 1 i 2 i 3 i 4 a i 3 plus a i 4 squared by 4. So, now these are n equations i equal to 1 to n and these are coupled quadratic equations in n variables. So, I want to solve these coupled quadratic equations in n variables. So, that is generally a hard problem. Coupled equations, coupled polynomial equations are not trivial to solve. The usual rule in um, mathematics textbooks, algebra textbooks, is that you can eliminate variables. You know, if I have some coupled equations p 1 x y equal to 0, p 2 x y equal to 0, then you can eliminate y between these. These are some polynomials <laughs> in two variables. You can get some other equation with p 3 x equal to 0. This is a much higher order equation than these, but you can actually always write, you can convert these two equations, eliminate y fully and get an equation in only the x variable. I will not give a proof for this result. This is sort of, you can figure it out yourself. You know enough algebra to take some couple polynomial equations and see if you can eliminate one of the variables and write the equation only for the second one. Okay. Yes, there was a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This this one is a square. And the, right now, this is an example. This is a particular example of a more gen. You know, you can do this with other models, but in this model, the left hand side is AI squared. Okay. I can make a model in which with some probability p 1 it goes north, with some p 2 it goes east and p 1 is not equal to p 2 and you know I will write some similar equations for that one and I can study that one. Okay. So, this one for couple quadratic equations it is hard, but this equation is nice and easy because I can solve it. It says a i is equal to plus minus a i 1 plus a i 2 
plus a i 3 plus a i 4 by 4. This new equation is a linear equation, so it is much better. I know how to solve linear equations. Okay. So, what happens is that you write as eta i and eta i equal to plus minus 1. So, for each choice of eta i equal to plus minus 1, you will get n coupled equations. You can solve them. That gives you one solution. And for the 2 to the power n choices of eta i, you get 2 to the power n distinct solutions. And uh, then the size of my matrix was just 2 to the power n by 2 to the power n. So, then I have generated all the solutions to my algebraic equation. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, sorry, but in the, the second, third, or third exercises you gave us, we had a kind of a relation that was like there was an operator a i to the square equal to a j to the, I don't know, 14. Hmm. So, uh, what I understood there uh, after doing some hmm. calculations is that you make these operators up as operators working on the recurrence space, hmm. you cannot just be, uh, square root every step. Every yeah. step. But here, I guess that the trick is that you are not applying the, them all over a recurrence space, yeah. but it's just a combination of that. Yeah, the, those, right now, these are just complex numbers, AIR eigenvalues. And I am trying to solve the eigenvalues. Okay. I will have to go back and see what is the corresponding vector. Okay. Right now, AI has a complex number. You, you do not expect an eigenvector to be a real state of the system. Uh, all the vectors are, are no, no, all the eigenvectors are not real states of the system in the standard sense. Okay. They are just eigenvectors of the evolution operator. Okay. Uh, we will. There is, there is one state which is the steady state, and there are two to the power n minus one other states, and they, you know all of them are some crazy states. <coughs> they are connected to the steady state by perturbation. If you take the steady state and perturb it in some way, then you go to a non-steady state, but which may decay into a steady state again. Okay, so just. Uh, side tracking, not back tracking. So, in a just uh, I will start with some steady state. Then I will perturb at one site I 1 at time T 1 and then relax the system and then I will perturb it at some i 2 at time t plus 1 and like that and then I ask for some <coughs> properties of the system. So, these will be time dependent correlation functions in the steady state, but the time dependent correlation functions depend on the full matrix structure of A because they connect the steady state to other states. The my perturbations are not always just A, they could be other perturbations. Right? I may measure the height at some site that corresponds to an operator which is you know applied to that state, it gives me the height at site i, z i is an operator. But if I apply z i and then evolve it, I do not stay in the steady state sector, I connect it to other states. So, if I want to measure height, height correlation, auto correlation function in the steady state, then I will have to go outside the steady state sector. Then I, <coughs> then I need to know all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of A. Just the steady state is not enough and that is why this algebra is useful in general. Even when you are studying a model where you are not able to solve for the algebra, it is good to realize that okay, there is all these eigenvectors, I got to actually determine them, but maybe I can approximate them or do something. Okay. The, so, the fact that there is a matrix structure for these operators, which can be handled in some cases, gives you a 
feeling about these operators which can be useful in more <coughs> general settings. So that is what I would say. Okay. So all right. So so if so two to the power n choices of eta i give me two to the power n eigenvalues Okay, so mm, that looks fine. And those are the eigenvalues of the. Um, yes, just one minute. Yes. Can't see. Can't see. Okay. Uh, can't see. Now, the last one is still not visible. Okay, I will write. <laughs> Two to the power n choices of eta i give me two to the power n sets of eigenvalues. A1, A2, An. Okay? So that sounds, uh, of course, you know, this is very formal. I said go and solve it. But um, who is going to actually solve even this couple of equations? Last time we had an equation Ai equal to just no eta, um, just nearest neighbor differences. That was the Laplace's equation. When we tried to solve it, it was a little bit of hard work. And it was not all clear and easy how to actually get the solution. Now you have put in all these etas and they are mm, somewhere it is plus, somewhere it is minus, then it's going to be more complicated. Okay? So how it is while these are linear equations, are they easy to solve? Okay. So then turns out that uh, sometimes if you cannot solve a problem, but you can realize that this problem was also studied by some other people, then you can look up the literature and see what they know about it. <coughs> and uh, it, may, it may not always help in solving the problem, but it helps you understand the one. So this one looks like del squared A equal to eta i. So this looks like the eigenvalue equation for a Schrodinger operator in a random potential. Because this is del squared and this is v and v is the potential, it takes pl values plus minus 1 and the corresponding energy is 0. So this is Anderson model, <coughs> Anderson localization problem. So you know you know something about the eigenvalue structure or eigenvectors of the Anderson model, then you can use that knowledge to solve this one or understand this one a little bit better or vice versa. Or you can say, oh, um, I wanted to understand the properties of the Anderson model near E equal to 0 in my units. However, Anderson wanted to study it as a function of E. So this is sort of the solution of the Anderson model at the band edge. And um, uh, so the connection of this problem to the Anderson problem and how much the solution of the Anderson model or the localization problem tells you about the MANA model. If I can solve the Anderson model, I have solved the localization problem. Can I de determine the properties of the MANA model? 
that still remains an unsolved problem. So at this level, the connection is established. But at the next level, using the connection to get some non-trivial result about the either the Anderson model or the sand pile model, still remains non-trivial. Because there were some results which we deduced about the sand pile model. For example, we said that, you know, I don't know the details of the sand mana model, but expectation value of S will go as L squared. That was a proof we gave early in the beginning. The mean number of toplings per added particle will go as L squared because it is a diffusive process. So what does it say about the Anderson model? There are no toplings in the Anderson model, right? But something or the other, there must be an equivalent statement about the eigenvectors, eigenvalues in the Anderson model. So what is it? So figuring out this correspondence is non-trivial. It has not been done in great detail. And I will leave it to you as an exercise. Mm -hmm. No, it, <laughs> it has not been done. So it is a good exercise. You can write a PhD thesis based on that work. <laughs> OK? All right. Uh, so I just want to mention one result about recurrent. Ah. Forbidden subconfigurations. In the mana model. So I start with this mana model we defined already. There is a maximum height is one. And if you add two particles, each particle goes in a random direction. Then what is the set of recurrent states? That's all we ask. So what is the answer? Can we give the answer? The answer is actually turns out straightforward. I will give the answer because you know you can use this answer to develop other answers. You know, this you can determine yourself, but it will take you some 10, 15 minutes, maybe one day. Uh, so all states are recurrent. All stable states. Ah. Proof. Proof is that if you start with some configuration of the mana model, so there are ones and there are other places which are um, zeros. From this configuration, with finite probability, non-zero probability. You can go to a state which is all empty. So this all empty state is reachable from any given configuration. We will prove this. But once you have reached the empty state, you can reach any other configuration from there by just adding. So all states can be reached from all other states. That is the proof. How do I ensure that I can reach um, the empty state from any given configuration? Well, I do it like this. I say that, oh, here is a 1 here, but I want a 0. So I add a particle here. And when I'm throwing, which I just throw them both up. I'm choosing. So with finite probability, this will happen. Once it happens, then I'm in this sum state like this. So all the I can empty out the bottom row like this because I just throw away particles from there up. And then I throw, empty out the next layer, and then I empty out the next layer. And eventually, I empty out everything. End of proof. No, no, no. So the proof is technically very straightforward but you have to realize that oh i can do this you know i can go like this i can prove that from any configuration you can reach the all empty state with some finite probability it is reachable and once it is reachable then all other states are reachable and all states are recurrent but now they are not recurrent with equal probability 
Okay, so that is the difference. Yes, please. So, is there a detailed balance now? No. No. They are reachable, but um, no, there is no detailed balance. Yes, please. Yeah. Two yeah. Does this say that all states are recurrent? No. no. Because some of these eigenvalues are actually zero. You can, when you work out, even for a 4 by 4 board or some such thing, you will realize 4 by 4 board is not so trivial. There are 16 eigenvalues. So you sit down and work them out, and you will realize that some of them are zero. It is clear that AI equal to zero solves this equation. Okay, so now what does it mean? It turns out that if the eigenvalue is zero, it says something about the um, A's, and it says some co applied on some state, it gives you zero, which means that the state is a transient state. But it need not be a exact configuration; it may be some uh, difference between you know, it may be a vector like. C1 minus C2. So, if you apply A on this, you get 0. Uh, I do not know that state is not a physical state, it is some state things will occur with positive weight, some things will occur with negative weight, but the eigen there is an eigenvector like this, but then I realize oh, but the matrices A are not always diagonalizable, they are only upper triangular or they have only the Jordan canonical form. So, even though eigenvalues are there, eigenvectors need not be there. Okay. So is this point well known to everybody? I am sure it is known, but is it appreciated by everybody? I have a vector. So, sorry, I have a matrix. This one, 1, 1, 1, 0. Actually, 0, 0, 0. All the eigenvalues of this matrix are 0, but there is only one eigenvector which is 0 and there are not two eigenvectors, right. So, there is this notion of generalized eigenvector. In physics, quite often people work with symmetric matrices or Hermitian matrices, where this problem does not arise. Once the matrix is diagonal, it is once the matrix is in the um, eigenvector basis, it is in the upper trigonal form, but it is also diagonal. But here you typically ent encounter cases where the matrices are not diagonalizable fully. So, the, these eigenvectors do not form a basis of our space of configurations? Uh, there are not enough eigenvectors in the first place. There are eigenvalues, but there are no eigenvectors corresponding to this eigenvalue. <coughs> I may add uh, new operators uh, that uh, form a complete basis. Yeah, I guess you could do some such thing. We know what the basis, we know the space we started with, right? So, if I take all these vector span, this subspace, all the orthogonal subspace is there, whatever it is, I can look at it, I can, you know, that is basis independent, but then I can choose whichever basis I like to describe the set of states. But uh, if I would have found uh, uh, 2 to the power n independent eigenvectors. Would it have been sufficient to say that the all states are uh, recurrent? No, that we have already shown without um, solving those 2 to the power n equations. Yeah, but if, uh, if the, this proof was not uh, available, we would, hmm. would it, it have been sufficient? Uh, no, the property of recurrence only says that the steady state with a, all a i equal to 1 has an eigenvector, right? That eigenvector has all entries 0 or non-zero, that is the question. The steady state being uh, all states are recurrent is only a question about one eigenvector. All the other eigenvectors are totally different question. Okay? Very good. So, in this case, it was simple. It turns out that the probabilities of configurations are much more different in the MANA model than in the um, deterministic toppling sand pile model. There all things were equally likely. Here the ratios of probabilities of different configurations can be 
10 to the power 10 or whatever, some very big number, can be exponential in n or exponential in square root n or some such thing. Yeah, 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 it depends on the details of the model. Even in 1D, one can try to solve this kind of a pro the 1D mana model that is already moderately non-trivial or non-trivial because it, in the steady state is not yet worked out. Okay? Yes? Yeah. How can we have uh, all the eigenvalues? Because the matrices are not diagonalizable, but they have always have characteristic polynomial. And I can look at the roots of the characteristic polynomial. So the eigenvalues always exist as the roots of the characteristic polynomial. They correspond to generalized eigenvectors or generalized eigenvalues sometimes. They are not eigenvalues, but they are generalized eigenvalues. Yeah. Not, yeah. Get yeah. Question. Yeah. So, in the Jordan canonical form, the problem only occurs if you have repeated eigenvalues. So, here the eigenvalue 0 is actually repeated quite a lot. But then I have to find out exactly how many times it is repeated and you know what is the space of null eigenvectors or some such thing. And that is a non trivial question still, even for this trivial. One dimensional model, the 2D Anderson localization is hard, 1D Anderson model is perhaps easier. Well, not still fully solved yet, and so on. Okay. So, so let us change. So let us change the mana model a little bit. Mana model. The root is still on the square lattice for the moment. But the rules are now that critical height is still true. Actually, we said it is 1. On toppling at a site, you can either go like this or like this. You send two particles out, they go either up or you know, up down or left right. No other choices are allowed. Sorry? Ah, with one half. Yeah, each with probability half. Now, I can ask the same question again. I can ask that can I, um, what are the, um, are all states recurrent in this model? The answer is no. Are there forbidden subconfigurations? And the answer is yes. Okay. So, let us see how does that work. So, let me give the result first and we will prove it. Is a forbidden, we called it FSC, forbidden subconfiguration. Proof. Suppose this is not there. Suppose there is at least one side particle somewhere here. 
Now you want to get rid, if you topple somewhere else, you can only add stuff inside, that is not going to work. I want to get rid of this one here. So I add a particle here and topple it and then hope to get out. But then if you add one here, then either you will add something here or add something there. So you will never be get rid of the one in a four. So you will never get all four zeros. That is the proof. Okay. It is just a sort of extension of the proof we used earlier. But only one small bit was added to the previous proof, <coughs> right? Because the model has two po possible topplings allowed, then you have to say under none of those choices I would be able to get rid of this one. Okay? So then I can ask, are there any other FSCs? So the answer is yes, yes, yes. If you work harder, you will find that there is also this stuff. Zero, 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 one, zero, zero, zero. Okay, proof is the same, you know, extension of the previous one. If this one was zero, then of course it was already forbidden. We did cannot occur, we know. So now can you create something like this? Um, I, I don't know, I, I guess the proof is that you cannot create it. Extension of the previous proof by induction. Okay. So then, you know, I, then I can ask, of course, what is the next forbidden subconfiguration? What is the next? What is the next? That's what we did last time. And we produce a list we can add to this list. You know, this is also an FSC, this is also an FSC, this is also an FSC. Then we will ask that, oh, yeah, but is there a simple test to put all these FSCs together and get a burning test for this problem? Okay. So it turns out that that is not possible yet. Seems one should be able to do it, but it has not been done. So f finding all the possible uh, recurrent states of the MANA model, and the answer is not known. Stochastic extension to the burning algorithm is not yet known. So that's an interesting unsolved problem. Okay. So if I were to pose this problem to a high school student, the way it is done, you say, oh, there is this 8 by 8 board, chess board, and you put pa particles, 1, 0, 1, 0, you know, whatever. You start with all ones, you know, that is the simplest starting configuration. And then you can add anywhere and you can topple any which way you like, either up, down or left, right. And can you produce a state in which there are no particles? So if the person is smart, he will all be able to prove that no, 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 it's not possible. We already gave the proof here. So the high school student can come up with this proof. Okay. So then I say that, okay, well, what is the least number of particles which will have to be present in order for the state to be recurrent? to be reachable from the state. Because the extension of the old argument, we, here we said that all empty is a reachable from any state and uh, from the state you can go to any other state. So now we say 1, 1, 1 is reachable from any state, all ones. Because you just add, fill the, all the zeros, you can add, you can reach there. From there if you can reach uh, any other state, then you are done. Okay, so and what is the minimum number of pieces which will be left on board if you are allowed to keep on toppling? And there is a 1,000, no, euros is too big a money, 1,000 rupees price <laughs> for being able to solve this problem. What is the minimum number of pieces left on the board if you are allowed to topple any which way you like, starting with all filled up? 
Okay? I can make it 1,000 euros. No, 1,000, I don't want to pay that money, sir. <laughs> okay, so that was sort of just um, about the um, stochastic sand piles. Then what I want to do in the remaining time, uh, okay, is to do the structure of finite abelian groups, which we didn't do last time. And the total number should be minimum. Total yeah, number of... Mm, I think the problem is different if you restrict yourself to configurations with some particles just in the border. Uh, I think no, the, the question is what is the minimum number? Prove that the minimum number is 28. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no, but, but uh, okay, then, then, then I'll explain. Okay. Uh, okay, so... So this stuff is sort of moderately elementary for mathematicians because if you talk to a mathematician, you say, oh, I'm studying the sand pile model. There is a group there. It's a very nice abelian group. So they say that, oh, abelian group, they are trivial. What is there to learn about abelian groups? Okay. So what they are referring to? is a theorem, oh, sorry, they say finite abelian groups are trivial, okay? <laughs> so what they are referring to is some result like this. It says, if you have a finite abelian group of order n, then the group is always of the form G is equal to Z D1 cross Z D2 cross Z D3 where D1, D2, Dr are positive integers greater than 1 and and di is a multiple of di min plus 1. So that is the result. So I want to just explain what is this theorem and how it is useful for us in some way. So firstly, what is zd1? <coughs> This is a very simple stuff. You just take some operator A, 1. And my algebra is that A1 to the power D1 equal to 1. Okay? So I can take the operator. So the G, as we will write it as ZD1, is the, uh, the set. Uh, of operators forming the group is set of values a to the power r r lies from 0 to d1 minus 1 because r to the power d is the same as r to the power 0. So this group is called uh, ZD1. That's the name mathematicians have given it. I know what this one is now. If you take an operator, just raise to all possible powers. 
then if using this reduction rule, all the powers can be restricted to be less than d1. Then you multiply two such operators, you get another one in the same list and it satisfies all the group properties and what else is there to say, nothing much. So that is my abelian group, that is the zd1, easily understood. Okay, what is zd1 cross zt2? zr cross zs is a group with two generators. A to the power ZR cross ZS, A to the power R equal to B to the power S equal to 1. So, the general element is A to the power R1, B to the power S1 with R1, S1, R1 lies between 0 and uh, R and S1 lies between 0 and S, right? You make all such powers like this, multiply them out and then it forms a group and this is a product group. It is a trivial, there is no big deal. I am just making you realize that there is no big deal. You do not have to be scared of the group theory because it is trivial, okay? So, the Z1, ZR cross ZS is a group which is trivial group in the sense that you take these operators, you can multiply them, you can always reduce the powers to less than R and S and uh, then that set of elements forms a group under multiplication of these elements, easy, okay. But this is an interesting result. So, if you take a Z3 cross Z5 is the same as Z15. Because I can take an element which is called A times B and consider, construct all powers of the single element AB and it will turn out that only the 15th power of this will become identity and all the previous 14 powers will not become identity. And so you will get 15 different elements which work. So, this group actually has only one generator whose 15th power is the identity and so this is Z15, okay. So, this method can be done more further and uh, you can mm, take two numbers like this and um, find a simple lower um, or, uh, group with lower number of generators. But there is also this another result which is also trivial to see Z2 cross Z2 is not equal to Z4. It says that if you take A and B and A squared equal to B squared equal to 1, you get a group with 4 elements. But that group is not Z4 because there is no element whose raised to the power 4 gives you the identity. Every element you take in that group, this is just, so this group is made up of 4 elements 1, A, B, A, B and square of everything is 1, right? Then there is, I cannot write it as Z4, it is different, okay? So, this one says that you can always, given a finite group, you can always write it in this form. That did not seem to me very, very surprising, but it says in addition D1 can be a multiple of D2, chosen to be a multiple of D2 and D2 will be a multiple of D3 and D3 will be a multiple of D4 and that is an extension of this. Uh, argument, okay. If there are some co-prime numbers, then you can choose the GCD of the two numbers as a bigger number and LCD as the other number and you know G of, okay, uh, let me write that result down and I will not prove it, left as an exercise. Z 
R cross Z S is equal to Z L C M of R S cross Z G C D of R S. Okay, that's a nice reason. You know, that's an ex exercise you can prove yourself. Don't read it anywhere. You will be able to prove it by yourself. And it's an interesting non-trivial result which will not strike you immediately. If I didn't write down this equation on the board, you may not have realized it. But once written, then the proof is automatic. I will not go through it. Okay, so this one, we want to prove actually in our case and how can we use this in my problem. So we will need another quantity which is important. That is the reason for going through all this. It's called Smith normal form. Of an integer matrix. So you give me any integer matrix delta. Delta is just an integer matrix. And the Smith normal form says any matrix delta can be written in the form. A, D, B. This is n by n matrix, no? And A, D, B are where A, B are n by n matrices. I think the word is unimodular. Unimodular means their determinant is plus minus 1. Then their inverses exist. For integer matrices, if I am not allowed to work with fractions, their inverses do not always exist. Because if the determinant is a big number, then I do not know how to do the inverse. Okay? But if the determinant is 1, then the inverses are easy to find. That is the reason for this SU. Uh, S, not U, but S something or the other with uh, L, S L N, because the subset where there are unitary unimodular matrices is a subgroup of the full thing. It's an interesting group. So A B are unimodular, and D is a diagonal matrix. With entries. D1, D2, D3, 1, 1, 1, with D1 is a multiple of D2, D2 is a multiple of D3, and so on. So it's a mouthful. The statement is quite long. Okay, but the proof is um, to be straightforward. So, if I take any mat matrix, integer matrix, I define an equivalence relation between matrices. Equivalence relation between matrices. A and B. A is similar to B if can be 
if A can be changed to be by row column exchange or by adding one row to another. Okay, this, this kind of notion is familiar to you actually. I am sure you have seen it before. You take a matrix and I can just exchange two rows. That becomes another matrix which is equivalent to the previous one by my definition. And I can exchange two columns and the new matrix is equivalent to the old one. And I can add <coughs> a row to the previous one one of the rows to another one, one time or two time or three times or subtract from one previous one and that is another e matrix which is equivalent to the previous one. You are familiar with this in the context of evaluating determinants because the determinant of matrix A is the same as the determinant of matrix B. But we are actually having a slightly more extended notion which is not only that the determinants are equal, but the matrices are equal in some generalized sense. Okay. So, very good. So, this is clear. So, you give me the matrix delta equal to this matrix. I can just look at all the entries and look at the diagonal and look at the lowest non-zero, look at the lowest entry in the non-zero entry in the whole matrix and bring it to the bottom diagonal by row and column exchange. A row exchange is implemented by multiplying the matrix by a matrix on the left. Okay. If A and you apply to it a matrix 1, 1, uh, sorry, 1, 1, 1 everywhere, but 1, 1 like this, row and, you know, two rows in are exchanged, you multiply on the left, then it will give you a transpose matrix, uh, sorry, in which two rows are exchanged. If you apply this matrix on the right, it will give you two columns which are exchanged. Okay. So, this is working my, I will keep track of what I multiplied by my multiplying by A and B on the right by look in the middle. So, all matrices can be reduced to this form where there is some entry here. Uh, then, I will just subtract, this is a small entry. So, I will subtract it from everything here and bring these entries to 0. If they are not 0, because I am only allowed to use integers, right? I cannot use fractions. Suppose I this is 7 and this is 3, then I just exchange the 3 and bring it down and then reduce the 7 to 1. Okay? Now, I will bring the 1 down and bring change the 7 to 0, 3 to 0. Okay? Is the proof clear? Everything was not written down, but everything was um, sort of rather obvious argument. This is what you do in solving linear equations. You convert an equation into a form in which there is a diagonal and everything else is zero. And we are saying that you can do the same thing here. Yes? Uh -huh. change? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it is up to plus minus 1. That is kept track of B. The matrix will have a determin negative determinant and this will also have a negative determinant. So, the matrix, the Z is of the form A, D, B where these are unimodular matrices. 
and the unimodular mat matrices keep track of whatever product and addition operators you are doing. Okay? So, my matrix finally will look like this matrix, but I had obtained it by one subtracting from here from here. So, I will write multiplied by the inverse operation 1 1 like this on the right right and so on ok very good. So, the hardest part is just this that so everything can be reduced to 1 in the diagonal except it so happens that all the matrix elements are multiples of something called D. Then in the lower diagonal you get D ok and so then if you so I can write a big matrix first I make this one and then there is a smaller matrix here then I make this one and there is a smaller matrix here then I make this one and there is a matrix but now all the elements are multiples of 2. Then this matrix will be of um, the lowest value I can get this 2 is 2 and then like this and then it goes on and that is how you get d 1, d 2, d 3. All the diagonals are um, multiples of the lower values. It is a powerful result I mean and it is not taught in class because in physics people just deal with um, diagonalizable matrices and they you know this one is working with integers. I am not allowed to use um, matrices which are non integer matrices. So, I cannot always use A inverse right. So, only working with integer matrices this is the best you can do and this is good enough for our purpose. Okay. So, why is it good enough for our purpose? So, if I take a matrix last time we got something I do not remember there was some delta matrix for this stuff and I worked out the determinant and it turned out to be 192. So, 192 can be written as 16 into 12 is equal to 2 to the power 7 into 3. Okay. So, what are the corresponding d 1 and d 2 which are possible? So, so I can have some values of d 1 and d 2 and uh, they should be such that the product of them is this number right. So, I have only this process the 3 should only occur here because if 3 occurs here then d 1 will not be a multiple of d 2. So, 3 should occur here and 2 to the power of 7 should be divided between these, but this power should be lower than this power. So, it will be 3 into 5 2 to the power 5 cross 2 or 3 into 2 to the power 7 or 3 into uh, 2 to the power 4 cross 2 to the power 3. Or 3 into 2 to the power 4 cross 2 squared cross 2. That is the only possibility. There are not too many choices. So, the fact that you are given the determinant as an integer, it has a factorization. The factorization can be written in this form in only a small number of ways. Okay. So, it gives you a choice about d 1, d 2, d 3 are more or less fully determined by the um, order of the group. You do not have much choice left. Okay. 
Of course, they were supposed to be the fact, you know, if you multiply these, you should get the order. That kind of determines the number, but the fact that they have to be multiples determines, it puts much more constraints. Okay. So now, ah, so we are doing well. So now, if I have somehow determined these matrices A and B, So, given delta, I can determine A and B. A and B are not unique. But D is unique for a given delta. You will only get that matrix, no other. Okay? So then, let me consider uh, so, this group, now, let me consider an operator called E alpha, which is by definition so now let me write uh, E alpha is equal to product over J A J to the power B alpha J. Yes. Uh, A and B are not unique. Oh, I beg your pardon. I, I wrote it wrong are not unique, but D is unique, okay? So, it gives you this. Then, uh, clearly, E alpha to the power D alpha is equal to identity, okay? So, what did I do? I multiply, raise it to power D, okay? So, A J to the power D B alpha J product over J, this is equal to this, okay? Because D alpha multiplied to the power B gives you D B alpha because this is a diagonal matrix. by construction, okay? But db is equal to A inverse delta, okay? So, this is the same as product over J, A J, A inverse delta, alpha J, okay? But A J to the power delta J is equal to 1. That was my equation. So, this is 1. So, this E alpha which we have constructed explicitly in terms of this B. B is an integer matrix, so I know these numbers. These E's are actually the generators of my group Z D alpha. You raise it to power D alpha, it becomes identity. And different alphas will give you different vectors. And so we have generated the group and we have generated the simple generators of this group. Okay? What goes what good is that? What is the use of all this? So in terms of these uh, groups. <coughs> <coughs> so, the point about all this exercise is to get a um, nice characterization of the set of recurrent um, uh, configurations. So, we said there is this set of recurrent configurations, it was kind of messy. 
because uh, there were some states which were forbidden and there were no easy coordinates for this set. Now we can define coordinate along the torus. So for each configuration C is defined by, uh, what shall we call it? R1, R2, R3, ah, phi 1, phi 2. No, phi is the bad number. R1, R2, R3 is good for me. R, R. Where this one, R1 takes values between 0 and um, D1. And R2 takes values between 0 and D2 and all possible values. There are no constraints. So all possible values of all values of E1 to the power R1, E2 to the power R2, E3 to the power R3 gives you all possible good ele group elements. And for each of these, there is a unique configuration. Okay, so I have a unique configuration, a unique label for each of these configurations, recurrent configurations, and now these sums over R's can be done easily because they just go uniformly from zero to R max. Yes. R one is less than D one, but and all the others are smaller or equal. Uh, sorry, I beg your pardon. No, no, no. They should be same. It's similar. It, it takes D two values. And you can choose them to be 0 to d minus 1, or you can take them to be 1 to d, whichever way you like. Okay? Okay, so very good. So this gives me the characterization. I think I only need to do one more thing about this, and uh, then we are kind of through. And that is a. Uh, through for today. So there is a very nice notion called toppling invariant. Okay. So we had this matrix delta. Sorry? Yes. Can you explain how you define the configuration in this way? Okay. So there is a torus which has uh, this uh, D1 uh, yeah. in one direction, D2 in the other, D3 in the other. So R1 is the coordinate along this direction, R2 is the coordinate along this direction, R3 is the coordinate along this direction, and RR is the last one. And so R1 takes values 0 to D, uh, okay. D1 and R2 okay. takes values. And these are just torus coordinates, and so they are very easy to write. Okay. So, in principle, if you want to sum over the recurrent configurations, you can just do this summation in terms of coordinates R and they are easier than the other ones. Okay. So, so there is a matrix delta and so you can define delta inverse Ij Zg. Summation over G is equal to I I of Z. You give me any configuration of the sand pile Z, and I will define a number called I I for this configuration, which is a linear function of all the Zs in the problem. It's a weighted linear combination. I make this way. I i is a linear combination of all the z's in the configuration. For each configuration, you define this number. Uh, let's define, you can define i1, and then we'll define i2. And so there are n of these numbers, actually. I define n of these numbers. OK? And then I do the following. I take this configuration z, and I topple it at any site I like. I get a new configuration Z prime. 
when I look at the value of i, what happens to the i when I change the configuration? Though i will change. How much will the i change? That is the question. That's not a hard exercise, no? All of you can do it in your head or on the piece of paper in front of you. So, what is delta i i is equal to i i of z prime minus i i of z. How much does the i coordinate change? This quantity i i i defined, how much does it change? So, the, I know how much does z change because z prime i was equal to z i minus delta i j sorry z j on toppling at i z j change like this. So, I topple that side j and all the z's will change by this. So, the delta i will be equal to summation over j delta inverse whatever times delta z j. So, this delta z j is this matrix delta multi um, no. So, it only changes by integers is equal to always an integer. So, the elements of i i were these elements which were actually fractions because delta inverse is a fraction, it is not an integer. But when I calculate this sum and I change it, it is always 1 and so the result which is straightforward to derive is that i i z by definition let us write <laughs> summation over j delta inverse i j z j and we will add mod 1 is equal to constant. So, if I topple at the site, this particular quantity does not change mod 1. So, the fractional part of it does not change. The full number may change, but its fractional part does not change at all. So, that is an invariant under toppling and I have got a large number of these invariants for arbitrary matrix delta. Okay. So, so these toppling invariants are very useful in understanding the structure of this problem. Uh, so, then I have to ask, okay, I have got this n toppling invariants, what do I do with them? Firstly, n is a very large number in many problems. So, you have lot of invariants, then you should ask, are they all independent or are they not independent? So, how many independent toppling invariants can you construct? <coughs> okay. So, ah. so, suppose I have a quantity I 1 mod 3, it is a invariant and I 2 mod 5 is also an invariant. Okay. Then I 1, I 2 is a quantity. Oh, I 1, okay. Anyway, I 1 plus I 2 is invariant. Um, I 1 plus I 2. 5 i 1 plus 3 i 2 mod 15 because i 1 is invariant mod 3. So, 5 i 1 is invariant mod 15 and uh, i 2 invariant mod 5 then 3 i 2 is invariant mod 15 
and this quantity is invariant mod 15, but it is a single number. But actually it is good enough for me because it takes 14, 15 different values and they can be used to separate different classes, equivalent classes. So, this is a single invariant which is equivalent to these two invariants. So, these two invariants are in some sense independent, but they are collapsible into a single invariant which is this mod 15 invariant. And you can do this for the sand pile in general and all those n invariants which we constructed can be reduced to just r invariants each corresponding to one of these integers. Okay. So, I will stop here. Uh, as you can see, there is some interesting group structure which emerges, but it turns out that the utility of this group structure in solving the kinds of problems we were interested in has not been so large. So, one can be a pure mathematician and go off in the tangent and study these problems at great depth. And um, I actually had a friend, uh, Professor D. N. Verma, whose name was mentioned by Shaheen in his lectures in terms of these Verma modules, who was a mathematician and he used to get very excited about, oh, there is a group and there is this thing and, this, and I would say, oh, yeah, so that, <laughs> like that. Okay. So, different people have different interests and, uh, but I think the problems are interesting looked at different perspectives and I am only pointing out that, you know, the group structure is nice and interesting and some of this stuff maybe you sh could have learnt and you did not learn before like the Smith normal form uh, and so on are useful for you to know and uh, maybe they will be useful later. And that is a uh, application of the Schenker theorem. How many of you remember the Schenker theorem? <laughs> Everybody did not come for the yesterday's video. No, nobody came. Some came. Okay. So, you know, it is something which does not appear to be useful today may be useful tomorrow. That is the general rule. <laughs> okay. Let me stop here.